Welcome everybody, my name is Trevor and uh, I want to thank you for joining us this evening for our special webinar about edge zones. Uh, a little bit about edge zones, these are real-time support and resistance levels based off volume and order flow. And Anthony, who's our speaker this evening, is going to be showing us and explaining what they are and how to use in some unique ways of using them. So um, if you have questions throughout the webinar, just go ahead and type them in. I'll be watching those and I'll do my best to go ahead and answer those uh, in real time. Otherwise, I'll pose those uh, later on uh, in the evening to Anthony. This is being recorded. The recording will be sent out tomorrow um, in an email, so keep an eye out uh, for that. A little bit about our speaker, Anthony Drager. He runs all the educational offerings here at Market Delta, uh, the daily trading room, which the edge zones are used in uh, every day in real time. It's a great spot or a great place to uh, get a trial or uh, subscribe to see these things used. You're going to learn a lot more than just the edge zones, but certainly that's going to be one of the things that's going to be reinfor reinforced and you'll learn a lot about as well as some of the other products like the Edge uh, trading course uh, and the Footprint Deep Dive. So he's kind of our uh, one of our in-house uh, footprint experts and this is a great opportunity to really hear from somebody who has an entire career of trading, not somebody who's just come along in the last few years or five years uh, and claims to know something about trading. He's actually been trading for I think now 17, 18 years, maybe coming up on yeah 18 18 years 19 years so um, he's got a ton of experience uh, the edge zones really are right out of his his experience as a trader things that he looks at uh, and has noticed as important so you will uh, benefit immensely hearing hearing his thoughts and uh, how he applies these things so without any further ado, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Anthony. Anthony? On the right, and if you've seen this, uh, if you've seen many of my webinars, I do this all the time, but it's important. He always told us growing up, my brothers and I, if you know how, you'll have a job, but if you know why, you'll be the boss. Well, tonight, we're going to talk more and more about the why, and, and that's about real-time analysis. How did I begin? In case you don't know me, I'll just run through this quick bio. I started in the pit at the CME in 1991, uh, 1991, got back in 96, then became a Board of Trade member and a pit trader in 1999. Couldn't make any money and found out that proprietary or electronic trading, as it was called back then, was on the doorstep here in the U.S. And I got a job at a prop firm. Didn't know what a prop firm was until I went there had a meeting and got offered the job. But I asked that question, what is it? What's a prop firm? Most people are in this business and don't know the right definition of a prop firm. It takes me, puts you around other traders, not with suits, however, gives you equipment back in the day, which was what? Computer, monitors, and a percentage splits worked out. Generally, not generally, it was always 50-50. You get half and the house gets half for a three-year contract when I started in April of 2000. Now, funny story, going back to my dad, as I asked him, I was still living at home, I said, should I take this job? And he says, go back to the office and look at the cars in the parking lot. The cars are nice, take the damn job, they're making money. The cars were nice, I took the job, and the rest was history. But a big 180 degree turnaround for me. I was ready to quit the business, and I became aware of this business model Got a meeting with the risk manager, a job interview with the owner, and I went from making no money as a pit trader, ready to quit to making more money than my dad. And I joke about this because I was home at 11 o'clock in the morning. He says, what the heck is it you're doing? I says, well, you should learn to become a trader. So real quick, an agenda page of today's or tonight's event. I can't talk about edge zones without at least... Briefly talking about footprints and what they are, I can't assume everybody who's going to watch this, either live or on recording, knows what a footprint is, but I'm not going to uh, go over it in too much detail. Then we're going to go over a footprint filter, how you could distill it down for bigger orders that come into the market. Then overlay edge zones and briefly talk about how they show where the tempo picks up in price action, and then bring it all together. 
Follow from the left, footprint plus a filter with an edge zone showing trap size equals what? And we're going to cover a lot of the what as well as the why tonight. Just a way to talk about everything I just mentioned on that agenda page. Questions and answers to understand footprints. Number one, what do footprints show? You should know the answer. It tracks aggressive buyers and sellers. So it's not just numbers on a screen anymore. They're real contracts, aggressively buying or selling in the market. Next question, what does a footprint filter do? Simply shows only big buy or sell orders that come in. And I'm going to show you that on a live chart. How about edge zones? What do they do? The answer, they create real-time support resistance using the speed of either order flow or the size of that price action. Again, I'll show you that on a live chart. We're going to spend most of this webinar on charts and not slides. And finally, what if you took the footprint and the filter, added the edge zones, and then added a new wrinkle of trap size? And I not officially call them edge zone diamonds, but when I first seen how the development worked, they just diamonds were what it looked like when they uh, turned old support into new resistance. And I want you to focus on that phrase, old support, new resistance, or old resistance, new support. And I'll show you how that lays out. Before I do that, I got to tell a couple stories because this is important when trying to read any order flow or any re, uh, support resistance, any lines that you might have for any kind of concepts you use. For me, I like point and figure charts, only for this. If you were watching a bird in the sky fly around, what would it look like? That's how we follow price on a chart. So I don't care what you use, candlesticks, bars, footprints, whatever, you have to follow it as if a bird is flying around in the sky and left a trail. That's what footprints do. They leave a trail, that's what all charts do. They leave a trail. The biggest piece of information is right now. Rotation for location is a phrase I put on it. So briefly, historically and traditionally, you look at candlesticks. Now, instead of this just being a column with numbers in it, don't kid yourself when people first see it, that's what all they see, you take it and you look at them as up and down bars or candles, now footprints. So if we're assuming this is an up bar, the next one would be a down bar. The next one would be an up bar and so on. Now, when you look at areas of what could be real time support in this case, this yellow line, you ask yourself why? Why would it hold there? Why would support in this particular instance be support? And we're going to talk about that. Before, I'd call them thin spots. With this latest development and edge zones, the visual is much better. And we'll introduce, for some of you, for the first time, stuck or trapped traders. In this image, baby birds. People say, well, what is baby birds. I got to tell a story when I do a webinar because if you haven't heard the story, it opens a lot of eyes. If non-professionals are helpless birds in a nest that need mommy bird to come and feed them, which is in this metaphor, the price of the market is mommy bird. How do you become the pro, the hawk, the predator? What does all this mean? Generally, when you're trapped in a position and price comes back to let you out, maybe let you out, you're helpless. And what happens in the next slide? Price is right about to fill you. You're going to get fed, and then the hawk rips maybe or mommy's bird's head off. She goes flailing to the street, and the birds are less, left with no fill. And maybe that's why support support. That's the dynamic that plays out in a market. That's the story you're, you're reading, whether you know it or not. When does this take place? And I've added this extra slide because I've literally been asked, well, what happens to the baby birds when they're not fed? And I say, eventually they fall to the street and they get run over by a car, which essentially means they blew their account out. So let's look at this on a chart 
behind it. And I've done this slide before, so if you've seen it, just be patient, but it's important to, to cover again, especially for people who haven't seen it. How does this example play in a simple candlestick chart? Let's look at this consolidation box. I always visualize these white boxes, whatever color you use, as consolidation ranges or fights, as I call them, because that's what happens in a range. You don't want to be caught fighting necessarily in a consolidation box because that's called getting chopped up. But you know people are long and short. When the market moves out of the box, and let's assume these images of baby birds are stuck shorts, okay? And let's assume the market does what it does. It rallies out and comes back. And now all these birds are nesting, helpless, looking to get fed. If you're short, if you guys can see my cursor, if you're short in this area, in this white box, and the price leaves and rallies against you, you're feeling a lot of pain. And don't kid yourself. It's not necessarily people in this webinar, people listening, but that's generally what everybody feels because most people are bad at getting out of losers. So when the price finally comes back to maybe let you out, you're as helpless as birds in a nest trying to wait for mommy to come and feed them. And sure enough, they're turning to buyers, right? What are you, after you're short, you're now a buyer. Everyone should know that. After you get short, open a short position, you're now a buyer to exit that position. You hope to be a buyer lower, but you're still a buyer. Everybody's been in this position, right? Everybody's been in a position where you say to yourself in this instance, you took a lot of heat, a lot of pain. All of a sudden, price is coming back and you're begging. You're in fact praying to God, just get me out. I won't hold on to a loser this long ever again. Just this one time. And of course, generally, if there's enough baby birds stuck down there, they buy it up and it runs away from where the pain started. And the pain started in that white box and when price left it. Now, a common pain point is this, and I show it with an image of a Peyton Manning going up to the line of scrimmage. The most important skill set that in this game, American football, that the quarterback has is to read the defense after he breaks the huddle. Why? because that's when he's going to get the most important information. That's where these edge zones come in. They become the present in a, in, a, in a highly visual way. So you could see the difference between the top photo and the bottom photo, how what they, call, what they say is called an audible, to give the team a better chance to do what? Score. In our case, find a better location. Read this bottom line here. Too many use the past to predict the future and ignore the present. I'm not saying that the past holds no value. It does, but it can't be the only thing you rely on to find good locations to get in and out of trades. You have to start thinking about the market and this business through the eyes of other traders. How do you think they feel? Put yourself in their shoes. You don't have to be in a trade to feel that emotion. It's going to start highlighting better location. Now, I'm going to get back to the how, the why, and the when, but first I want to go to some live charts. And I want to stay on this one. This goes back to what I talked about at the beginning and in the email, and that is the filter. So this is the chart I left you on, filtering it for about 200 contracts or more. And we're just going to walk through. If you watched the video that we used in the email about this webinar, I just sped it up, and this is today. This is actually right now, as the these are the S and P E minis and the D's contract trading 29.11 here on the right, and this was old support that worked once for a rotation. We talked about right following the birds in the sky. That's these up and down motions that you see in the footprint. You could see it work as support, and as soon as they take out support, which would be in this area, subsequent resistance that we'll see it work here even in the overnight session right all of this was on the close generally you get an influx of orders but let's take this chart and just go back you don't have to take images and just go back on any chart to show when you see a dashed line and it's green it's new support 
it came from what would have been resistance, so old resistance, new support. And it doesn't work great, but it works a little bit in here, right into the close. If I take it back, you could see it work good in here as the market comes in and rallies away. There's a couple of them. There must have been a couple old resistance that spit out this new support, right? Market rotates into it, calls the bottom of the range. If you guys could see my cursor, all in here. Now you're going to see it go, go from old support. Let's just look at this green line in here. And once it gets taken out, it becomes new resistance. Does it work great? It calls the consolidation for 20 minutes before it starts to break out and move. I just want you to focus on old support, new resistance, or old resistance, new support. And this is on a filtered chart for roughly 200 contracts or greater. The zero by zero means there wasn't 200 or more in that particular price. This is where this green line came out. Just focus on this 236. They came in, they came off a little bit, rallied, and then they used it as good support subsequent to that. Here's where the old resistance turned into new support that allowed the market really good support in there and really good support in there. Now, this actually happened during the trading room hours. Those that are in the room remember it. And it was these two sellers came in, 217 and 241. And you could see the market couldn't go down. You didn't have to wait until it didn't go down. As we were talking through this, I said, when something that should happen doesn't, is where your clue is. That's where the edge lies, and that's reading real time. Two things with reading order flow. Number one, recognizing important buying and selling. And number two, asking the right question. That's what's important. The right question, and then at the right time. So when you see these, sell these two big sellers come in, and in the room, I had said, if it can't go down, it's most probably going to go up. Most probable, the right, the the most probable right side is the upside. This actually took a little bit longer than normal, but you could see it rotate in here and then lift off and continue to rally. This was old resistance that didn't work as resistance because in real time sellers couldn't get it go, to go down. I'm going to show you an example of what was also in the video. If you guys remember, a stuck long or stuck short. And this is kind of the same thing where when you get selling in anything, if it's the price of the S&P minis, crude oil, the price of a car, the price of a house, there's a lot of selling and the price doesn't go down. There's something underlying that creates the clue that it's being absorbed. Big selling can't go down. The probability is the upside. Now we come in here, next example. Again, this is all today's trade. My whole intention is doing this webinar is I'm not going to go back days or anything else. We're going to go back on today's session. On this rally, I got to show this though. I got to show this with a pen because if, if I don't and people ask this question, I'll feel bad. Just follow my pen. That's how the market's moving using this point and figure on a footprint, all right? That's how the market moves. This is the high of the move, then it rotates down. This is the low of the rotation. Rallies up to there, sells off down to there, low of the rotation, and so on. So if you draw the X's at the top and bottom of each column and you connect them, that's following a bird in the sky, okay? It's simple but most people don't follow a chart that way. Let me get back to my mouse. So this 200 lot comes in and he gets the market to go up, which is what's supposed to happen, right? Big buying comes in, it should rally, it does, works as good subsequent support. Then you could see this stuck. Well, he's not necessarily stuck and we don't know that at the time, but there's information here. 191 gets sold at the price of 07, and three quarters. Does price go down? Initially, yes. Does it stay down? In here, you could say no. 
this is how to trade a particular support level. And I don't care, guys, if it's a support level that you have from a low value area node from a profile study you do, or if it's some math that you come up with a level. You still got to qualify it and trade it in overlap real time. So if you look at this again, you could see when do you get in? And it's by asking the right question at the right time. And when the answer becomes, it's pretty odd that selling couldn't get it to go down. You don't know it in here, guys, but you know it when it's up here. Could you predict every time it's going to rally another three handles? Of course not. It's a probability game. But you begin to qualify how to use this to trade. And that was one of the bullet points of this webinar is the what, the how, the why. And it's important to try to find selling whether it's a big seller or not, and the darn thing can't go down when you see it within this green edge zone. This is new support. It's not new support old resistance. When it's a solid green line, it's new support. Now, do you have to wait until you get a red seller inside a green zone? Of course not. You're not going to get it. It's not going to be that exact. It's just selling in the area that you think could become support and create a bounce. Now, let's go on. We had some dashed diamonds, and call them diamonds or not, I just what they look like when I originally seen how this was going to look because I, I didn't want them solid green lines. I wanted to know the difference between new support and this becoming coming off of old resistance. So this is old resistance. The market finally breaks out to the upside, right? It moves through it. We don't know any of this is going to happen. But what we do know is that they took out resistance and these green dash lines should become support. And they do. They become great rotational support in there, decent support in there. Yeah, it gets through it by two or three ticks. Remember, each one of these dash lines or solid lines are just one tick wide. These aren't three or four tick areas. So you could see it hold as great um, support throughout this whole sequence. This was around 930 this morning central time. Now we take it a little further. When this was resistance, did it work? Because it broke out right over there, right? And then you tell me. So it was three lines of resistance and held nicely in here, held nicely back in here when they spit out these big sellers. This big seller got it to go down right away. This guy kind of did too, created these three red lines. So the thought was be careful trying to get long into this area because it's probably good resistance. And why I call it real-time resistance is because nobody was going to know before the market opened that this was going to be resistance. Your best levels are going to be created after the game starts. So then we follow it back to the right, and you could see this dash green work as pretty decent support, calling the bottom of this range for a while. And then this green turns into maybe new resistance, and it doesn't work. You could say it worked in there, but that's just one rotation. What's important is I don't know that it didn't work. I mean, listen, it's obvious to know it didn't work. Let me put a pen on this. Once it's up in here, that's too late. That's not reading the real time. But I could begin to scratch my head that it didn't work that that resistance didn't work when I'm in here. And then you take the context of, well, what when I look over my shoulder, what happened? The market threw a consolidation box in there. It has some, some highs, rotational highs on the top of the range. I don't know about you, but when I see it break, what normally is good resistance, and it's testing the top of a range, I don't want to be short. I don't care if you get long. I want people to say, I stayed out of a short there, Anthony, and I saved myself a losing trade. I don't want people to avoid taking losing trades. I want them to shave their losing trades. A great marketing scheme would be tell you guys how much money could be made in this market and in this business and show you all kinds of winning trades. But to be honest with you, and there might not be more things sold on this comment, but it's not how much money you make, it's how much you don't lose. That's what's important. Let me erase these illustrations and go back 
to a arrow. If you guys are asking questions or making comments or anything, I can't see them. I will look at them. And like Trevor said, we'll uh, keep time open for a Q&A before it's all said and done. So let's go back into this morning on the open. You could see kind of the opposite of the video. Remember the video I showed a stuck low or a stuck uh, seller in the hole? This happened in real time, and we were able to talk about be careful being long. And if you're bearish, it's an opportunity to get short when this 220 comes in and, and they can't rally it. Now, I don't know that they can't rally it. Neither do you right in here, but we could start asking the question. Why didn't it even go up a tick or two? And then when it starts to slide down, this becomes more predictable. So you could see how you're telling and and kind of reading a more accurate story. Now let's take a look at where old resistance in here becomes new support. You could see it hold as the bottom of consolidation for a while, but let's look to see where this resistance came in. It did not work the second time as resistance, but when he came in 242 and got it to come down in here, this rotation was able to hold. This was actually, this is interesting that this um, was right at eight o'clock because it was when, this was news driven. This is when China came across the wires that they were gonna retaliate with tariffs and uh, the market got bearish pretty quickly. So this buyer was caught being laughed at. He comes in, they go right against him. That became good resistance. He dipped all the way down to like the mid 90s and then rallied back up. And here's what I said in the room because the room was open. This was right after the open then. This was at eight o'clock up here. We come off, we re-rally to test what could be new resistance. And I told guys, there's a good chance that this holds as resistance. Then it does right in here, comes a tick or so below it, rotates down just a few ticks. Coming up in here and I says, I'll be surprised if we go through it, but I'm not surprised for long. As soon as it gets up into here, I told everyone, when good resistance doesn't work and you're confident that it's good resistance because you're used to watching these lines or whatever lines you watch, that's very telling as well. When, when good resistance doesn't work, you could expect follow through to which side? The upside, right? Good resistance fails as long as it's good, something you're confident in. It's also helpful, but you can't be wrong for long, right? You can't still think this is resistance down in here when we're trading 05 quarter and it was 01 even. That's not trading. That's not being to, that's not um, allowing yourself to adapt to the real time. Another, another kind of saying that I'll mention is trading isn't about how often you're right. It's about being good at being wrong. I mean, who says that? In this business, you're supposed to be wrong as long as you're doing what your strategy says. You should be able to look at a trade three hours in the future and say, am I going to be proud about this trade when I go to review it? And if the answer is yes, you're supposed to take it. Don't try to avoid all losers. That's all part of a good trading plan. And then this works into the overnight session. This is like three o'clock in the morning Chicago time, which would make sense, you're not gonna see a lot of big buying or selling, right, in the overnight session. And so you don't, you just see a lot of empty. Now there's volume being traded in here, just not when you filter it down. So what's key to this whole process is you take a footprint, you put in criteria to throw in edge zones to make the real good support resistance more visible. You filter it down to just bigger trades. And then the final dimension that gives you a big advantage over anyone else is when old support finally gets taken out, could it be new resistance? And you guys are seeing that being the case. Anthony, there's a question from Dale here. It kind of goes along. Well, I think it's a good time to ask it. He's asking, um, can you talk about using um, the edge zones as areas for stops, both for stop losses as well as uh, entering on a stop, you know, like Absolutely. a buy stop or sell stop to enter a trade? 
Yeah, and it's a great question because it's when people think about where to put their stops, they're talking about where to get out for a loser, typically. It's how most people use buy stops, get out of shorts that are losing trades, and sell stops to get out of longs for a losing trade. And it's a way to manage your risk, which is great, and that's fine. But you want to put your stops in appropriate places because what really stinks about trading is if you get stopped out and then it goes. You're long from 01 even. You're risking down to to uh, to evens, four ticks. They trade even, stop you out, and then it rallies to 05. Raise your hand if that's happened to you. My hand is in the air. So the thing is to make sure that your stop placement is as good as could be. And what better features to use than real-time information? So, yes, this gives you a sense of where am I wrong? I'm always asking that to myself. Before I get in, I know where I'm going to get out. And that was one of the first phrases taught to me back in 1997, 98, when I took pit trading classes back then to be a pit trader. Know where you're going to get out before you get in. And so these levels could help you say, well, I'm bearish this market. Or if I'm short this market, not necessarily I'm bearish this market, but if I'm short, I'm wrong above these lines. Now, I also want to look over my shoulder and say, did these two dotted lines already work a few times? Because the more a resistance level works, the less likely it's going to continue to work. So you, you take this thing back and you say, yeah, it worked and it worked really well. It came out in here. This 250 got taken out, was stuck. They took out this green support. They threw in these two old support, new resistance, right? And you could see how well it worked as the top of consolidation in there and then sold off. And the next time it visited that level, not that it won't work again, but it's just less likely to work. But if you're short in here, Dale, or anybody else, it's a good place to get out because generally what? When good resistance taken out, it's going to follow through the upside. And it does to the tune of about two and a half points. While that might not seem like a lot, this is in the overnight session. It's a huge move in the overnight session, two and a half points from these red lines to what ended up being the high of the move, 99 three quarters up there. So I think that, Dale, is what you were asking. It's a great question. Hopefully I answered it. Let's see what else, if there's anything else before I move on. No, the one I am, the one other question I'd answered. So, um, all right, you're good. So that's, I mean, I could go, we could go over and over this, but I think you guys get the point. Let me bring up another market, crude oil, which I don't trade. I watch. I think it's important if you're an ES trader, keep an eye on crude oil. Sometimes it influences um, moves in direction in stocks sometimes. But a lot of people trade crude oil. Crude oil in the last year and a half has changed from a, a very illiquid market to a much thicker market. It's cheaper to trade now. I'm not saying it's cheap to trade. It's just cheaper to trade than it was a year and a half, two years ago. It's $10 a tick, but there's more liquidity at each bid and offer than there used to be. So what is considered a big size buy or sell order is going to be smaller in oil than the ES because the ES is thicker with what trades at each price. However, in oil, what's considered a big order is bigger than it was a year and a half ago. So filtering this down to around 50 lots, you could see old, well, I don't want to say old support, but a big buyer comes in, market comes down, it starts to tag maybe potential resistance. They take out this support, potential resistance, works decent. Potential support in here, big seller, works decently. What guys have to do is whatever your main market is, we've got settings that in our deep dive program and everything else, I'm more than happy to share. But I encourage people to massage the numbers that are going to give you not too many, but not too few lines. You don't want to chart with all kinds of lines on it. You're not, you don't know if you're coming or going. So you want a sweet spot. So with these settings, I found a sweet spot. It matters if it's a point and figure and what number of point and figure. That's why I started 
in one of the earlier slides, a bird in the sky, because you've got to understand rotation. And then look at this. Once it takes it out, and you don't know this when it ticks right there, but when it comes down into here, you could assume there's maybe more downside. And don't try to be too perfect. Remember, this dashed line is just one tick wide, one penny wide in crude oil. And as you guys know, while crude oil is thicker than it was a year and a half ago, it still has pretty decent ranges throughout the session, right? Here's a guy stuck right at the top, 49 lot, lifts the offer around 70.04. Now, I don't know that the market is going to do this and come all the way off 50 cents, but I do know early on to start asking the right question. Why can't big buying send the market up? Why can't big selling in here send it down? Then it pops. Why can't a big buyer send it higher and it breaks? Where does it come back to? Coincidentally, back to old support where this guy stuck new resistance? Of course not. That's why when I was talking to Trevor about doing a webinar for this, what should we name it? I said, well, you, look, you can't make this stuff up. And I just rolled through a chart of today. And he's like, yeah. but that's um. Crude oil, just a, another way to look at a different market. Same thing, filter it down, distill it down to just bigger orders. Now, I want to tell you guys something. Just because this is the um, a filter doesn't mean I don't look at all the orders. I still got edge zones that I cut off on a 4 PNF, so I don't get the reds running across, or else sometimes it gets too noisy. But I want to see and this is something I wasn't planning on covering tonight, but when a big seller comes in, you put yourself in a position to ask the right question. When selling comes in that you could visualize with these edge zones, again, you ask the right question. If selling came in in here and we rotated down a few ticks, if we start getting above it, it's like what Dale asked. Is it give me a good stop placement? And the answer is, of course. This is actually um, right in the now, 11 half, a big sell-off. I wonder if it was a headline during this uh, this event. But uh, this is what you'd see in the room on this chart. And I added it to the bottom just to show um, the old support, new resistance, these dash lines. This in greater detail, and not just the edge zones. But everything footprint, you get an email like Trevor said with the recording and then the promotion. This has been the culprit, this Prezi. I downloaded it to a portable Prezi and it's jammed me up. But we'll go over the how, the why, and the when, then we'll wrap it up. So how does it help you? By filtering any market. It takes bigger orders and easily allows you to recognize when they come in. Why? Refer to the baby bird story. Why is support support? Why is resistance resistance? It's stuck traders. And finally, when to trade it. I showed you one or two examples of some stuck selling in potential support or maybe some stuck buying in potential resistance. If you read this, it'll make sense. Stuck selling at a previous stuck short. The guy was stuck short. So the market rallies up, comes back down, and more selling, and the darn thing isn't going lower. Stuck selling where there was a stuck short. Again, you refer to that baby bird story of the helplessness people have when they're stuck the wrong way. So whether or not this slide allows me to pull it up, let me go through a couple questions. So Stanley asks, what does the one in one by four tick mean? That's uh, P and F. So it's one by one. Each bar will have four ticks. Not of a range, but of a rotation. The one would be the box size. If, in a, if you think, if you know anything about point and figure, essentially one means one tick. And then four is the reversal. So when it reverses four ticks, it would start a new bar. So that's kind of how that works. 
a couple things about learning more, and I'll get to this slide in a second. I get a good question by Grace about in this type of chart, when to enter a trade. It's the example of seeing a big seller come in on the on the filter, Grace, and you're in a position to want to buy it anyways. You're bullish. You think there's support. And now the qualifier is a stuck short. Another question, an e-mini trader, he says, what is the right configuration to display proper support resistance in the footprint? I like, first of all, point and figures for rotation. And then overlaying these edge zones to see when this rotation comes in um, with the proper, not only with the, the proper settings, with different volume criteria. So like I said, you don't get too many or too few lines. But the first thing when I'm asked about configuration is ranges, ticks, Renko, five minute, 10 minute. I like point and figure. The threshold, which is also the filtered size in this question was roughly 200 in the E-mini examples I was showing. Let me go over this slide and we'll get back to questions. I added this twice to go and make sure people underscored the how, the why, and the when. With the why being the most important, if you don't know why, if you don't know why support is support, you're not going to be confident to trade it. You got to think of why a market would go up after you buy it. What's that dynamic? What makes you think you're so special? You're going to buy it at the price of three. Somebody else is going to come in after you and try to buy four, five, six, and seven so you could sell eights for a winner. What makes you think you're so special? It's about timing the market with location, using order flow to find people stuck short. They're the emotional buyers that buy it after you because they're climbing over each other to get the heck out of a short. You have to think through that progression because that's what's going to highlight location. So the Footprint Deep Dive 10 video, now 11 video program. We've added a video and it's going to include a little bit more depth and settings for what we went over tonight. If you're not familiar with the Deep Dive course, you can go to edge.marketdelta.com slash footprint here at the bottom of the page. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about it because there's a video and you could see the um, title of each course. There used to be 10. There's going to be an 11th one added for those that get it, but it includes the easy settings, like I said, from tonight's event. If you know nothing about the footprint, you have to find some sort of comprehensive, whether it's this or something else, do yourself a favor and understand that these aren't just a bunch of numbers on the screen. I used to have people say, what's the column with the numbers in it? And that's fine if you originally say that when you first get a look at the footprint, but you can't keep saying it. You got to know where they come from and why they get bigger and why they might even throw these edge zones out. Also, I believe we're going to throw in, right, uh, Trevor, the Chicago Trading Workshop Program, which is something we did a year ago live. It's included for anyone that gets this deep dive program by the end of the week, correct, by Friday. And again, you're going to find out more about what the Chicago Trading Workshop was all about. Three days of footage with four speakers. Go to edge.marketdelta.com and you'll find out more about that. But that's included if you do the deep dive by Friday, including with all these edge zone settings, with all the um, the filter settings, but also the uh, – all the volume criteria, so there's not too many or too few, including the what's called consecutive, which shows old support, new resistance, um, and double stack areas. And so there's there's a lot of great new features that were added from the original first 10 videos in the deep dive, and that's what's going to be included in the 11th video. And so question is, is there a new version of the deep dive? No. I'm going to add this video to it and then include the workshop program 
for those that do it by Friday. For those watching on recordings, you, you won't know this because we stopped the recording, but everything was pretty seamless. For those that were here live, I apologize again. I use this Prezi and generally it's great and I downloaded it to a portable Prezi and, I, and my uh, CPU usage went up and I didn't have time to shut everything down and do it. So I went with it and it was like a, uh, a uh, short trading loss. Trevor stopped, uh, stepped in and uh, I got stopped out but got back in. So I'm glad you guys. Yeah, I don't know if me. I did it soon enough, though. <laughs> I didn't add to the loser. I'll put it yeah. that way. So I think it. It. Um, I could tell by the the questions that you guys. You know, honestly, I could have done this video or this webinar in five minutes, but I wanted to walk you guys through some important. Um, just that that ro rotation for location slide. When people see it or after you buy it, you're a seller. Those are really important concepts in trading. The whole dynamic of after you get long, you're a seller. Well, so is everybody else. So if everybody's long, it's hard to go up, right? You almost have to clear a path of sellers. How do you clear a path of sellers to go up? You shake out all the longs. Happens to people all the time. So you don't wanna be in the shakeout. You wanna see if you can get in the market after the shakeout. That's all part of real-time analysis. Look over your shoulder and ask yourself, am I in with a bunch of other people or did those other people get shook out? Let me scroll down, see if there's anything else. And also remember this, this is a, a um, it's all automated. So you don't have to keep clicking and putting in your lines. It's essentially all, um, once you have your settings locked in, it makes it easy, and then and you're understanding the why they would be plotted. That's what's important about understanding edge zones is not only where they came from, but why they would work. Always gauging tempo and the speed at which markets move. It's a huge part of reading order flow. Trevor, you want to add anything? No, I think that last comment um, definitely is key. That these things, a lot of times, support and resistance, uh, you tend to focus on just maybe recent highs or recent lows, but a lot of people don't think of support and resistance as coming out of the middle of a bar. And not that these come out of the exact middle, but the point is they'll, they'll appear not at a high of a bar or low of a bar. They just appear and they're solid support and resistance and the fact that they automatically this just automatically happens is uh, something i think a lot of people you might take for granted um, but it's nice and it's 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 very useful and helpful so i would i would encourage you check these things out um, we've got a bunch of resources on the site on how to add them um, you can reach out to us. Uh, the deep dive has some extra materials, and then uh, the settings you saw tonight will be added in that 11th video. So hopefully if you find that worthwhile. But I had a guy I talked with on Friday, and he, he was changing some things, and he was uh, actually canceling the service and canceling the Market Delta desktop. And I told him, uh, well, okay, fine, um, but check out these edge zones and let me know next week. He replied, um, it was this morning or last night and said, these I've used them the last two days and I really like these. This is really helpful. He didn't, he didn't, he just didn't know they existed. So I, I'd say the same thing to everybody else. Try them out see if they're helpful uh, for how you trade and your, uh, your style. Other you know than what's that, interesting though, is yeah. that you can't assume that anybody else is going to, learn this find this and use this so many people he just brought up an example of someone using the desktop but didn't know that these existed and it, it has everything to do with everybody else you're trading against glosses over the simplicity and the simplicity is where all the value is they want they want to either find a really complex strategy or solution for a complex problem or they want the super easy way of someone else selling them a system or a green arrow or a red arrow so don't think that 
well, he does a webinar for this and it's on the website that everybody knows about it. They don't and they won't take the time to learn it like you guys have done or those watching here on a recording. Don't devalue that. The, these, this creates the reason why I call them the edge zones is because they create an edge and you can't make it up. Go back and look at them and call me a liar. You won't. They're really good stuff and it'll keep you out of trouble and, and, and um, almost force you to find better locations. So I'll let Trevor wrap things up, but thanks again for coming. Again, I apologize for the, the tech issue I had with this, but uh, everything, it's not about the problem. It's only about the solution. So thanks again for coming. And Trevor, I'll, I'll let you wrap okay. it up. No, thanks again, Anthony, for the presentation. Again, we do apologize for those tech issues. But that's the way it is sometimes. Um, this is being recorded. We'll send this out tomorrow. We'll send uh, also a link for the, uh, the promo for the deep dive that he uh, had mentioned. And that'll be good through Friday. So thanks again for joining us at this uh, different hour. And uh, you guys have a great evening or day if it's just getting started. And uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Thanks.